It's great to see everyone this evening. We commend you for the spiritual appetite that brings you back here at 5 o'clock to study again from God's holy and inspired word. While Dale's announcement didn't surprise me, I had heard that, didn't make me happy either. You know, Dale and Peggy have been a fixture at the Broadway Centerville Road congregation before I came, so you know how long ago that's been. But I know this, when couples like Dale and Peggy and the Bransfords, when they leave us, as both of them will be, the church where they're going is going to be stronger, and really that's what it's all about. We're not happy that they're leaving, but we certainly bid them Godspeed, and we will miss those two great families. It was good to hear Brother Tyler this morning presented a lesson, Scary Truths. Now, I'm not trying to preach his lesson, but let me just say this. Tyler did not preach that to scare us, okay? It's a lot like 1 Corinthians 4 in verse 14. Paul writing to the Corinthians. Remember what he said, I don't write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as beloved children. So I think if we paraphrase that, we could say Tyler didn't preach those things to scare us, but to introduce us to or to remind us of the fear of God. A very viable, very important Bible subject. It's sad that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Jeremiah 2 and verse 19, God says, The dread of me is not in you. In Romans 3 and verse 18, Paul says, There's no fear of God before their eyes. That reverence that we should have for God and His Word, it ought to be active in our lives. God says in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. You see, in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. And in Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end of knowledge, it's not the end of wisdom, nor is it the end of our service to God. Remember 1 John 4 and verse 18, perfect love casts out fear, for fear involves punishment, and the one who fears has not been perfected in love. Basically what John is telling us there, we're not serving God only because we fear punishment. We serve Him because we love Him. And that's what he goes on to say in the very next verse. We love because he first loved us. So he gave us a very challenging lesson, not to scare us, but to remind us of where our hearts and minds should be in reverence, deep reverence to our God. Well, tonight, let's look at this lesson. And yes, I know for those in my Wednesday night Bible class, I'm not confused. Okay, I know this is Sunday night. This is what we've been looking at on Wednesday night, building a relationship with God. But you know what? We're not going to be here. I'm not Wednesday. Won't be with you in that class. And then I notice that the next Wednesday is our fifth Wednesday. So that will be our fifth Wednesday singing. So there's a couple loose ends that I wanted to tie up. And this will be good for all of us, not just the Wednesday night class. But think about this, building a relationship with God. We need to, you know, just indelibly write this thought on our hearts. That's what we're trying to do. We want a relationship with our God. Notice a couple of truths to begin with. Important considerations. God wants to have a relationship with you. Throughout the Bible, we find that. And we should be thankful for that. You remember in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. What a special relationship. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. You remember in 1 John 3 and verse 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. 
God wants to have a relationship with you. Secondly, this is the most important relationship known to man. This relationship with our Heavenly Father, it supersedes every relationship here on earth. You remember in Luke 14 and verse 26, Jesus is teaching there about counting the cost. Three times he's going to say, unless you do this, you cannot be my disciple. Well, in verse 26, he, he says, you know, unless you hate mother, father, wife, children, sister, brother, and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Now that term hate, it's better explained in Matthew 10 and verse 37. Love less. That's what he's saying. You have to love me supremely. You put me over every other relationship. And so again, this is the most important relationship known to man. You remember a sad verse in 1 Samuel, the second chapter, verse 29? God tells uh, Samuel in that context, you have honored your sons more than me. Think about that. Eli it was. Uh, I said, Samuel, it's Eli. You've honored your sons more than me. And so whenever we honor anybody upon earth more than God, we again are not understanding this point. It's the most important relationship known to man. Notice this, even the closest relationship needs guarding. This one certainly does. And we should know this because even earthly relationships... The closest relationships, they need guarding, they need protecting. That's why Paul would say, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. That's why Paul, writing to Titus, would tell older women to teach younger women, to love their children, to love their husbands. Titus 2 verses 4 and 5. Even the closest relationship, it needs guarding. And we need to guard our hearts. Out of it flows the issues of life. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. And another thought, think about this. We must build this relationship with care, concern, and compassion. We're in the building business, building a relationship with God. And let's build this relationship, the most important relationship we'll ever have. Let's build it, as we've said, with care and concern and compassion. The scripture that was read tonight, did you notice that in the wise man and the foolish man, the foolish man was not condemned, he was not rebuked because he didn't build. I think sometimes we, we think, well, as long as I'm building, I'm okay with God. Well, everybody's building. The foolish man built, but he built his house upon the sand. And so, yes, we need to be building, but we need to know what we're building. Build it with care. Build it with concern. Build it with compassion. The wise woman builds her house. The foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Proverbs 14 and verse 1. And so she's building her house there with wisdom. It's important enough to do that. Well, look at this. Here's really the lesson. Two final questions. I entitled it this because we had several questions last Wednesday night. You know, we asked, is it hard to tell when somebody is building or growing in the spiritual, I mean, in the physical realm? In the answer to that, in the physical realm, no, it's not hard at all. You can see that. You know, our, our five senses detect that. And we ask the question, why is it harder in the spiritual realm? Well, because we are, you know, dealing with a different realm. We can't just touch that and understand it and see that and smell that and taste that. And it doesn't work with our physical senses. We can tell spiritual growth. I'm convinced of that. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 15, Paul tells Timothy, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, that your progress may be evident to all. So the progress can be evident, but it's not as quickly evidenced, is it? And so we had several questions. Here's the final two that we want to look at tonight. These two will help every one of us.
that's serious about building our relationship with God. Look at this question. What false measurements do people employ when trying to determine spiritual growth? Now notice that. What false measurements? These are not legitimate. These are pseudo measurements. But from time to time, you'll hear people employing these, you know, using these to show that they are growing like they should. Maybe we have used these same measurements. But these are false measurements. These are pseudo measurements. Look, if you will, this first one, someone says, I have a good reputation. Well, we should be striving for that. But that in and of itself... It's not a legitimate measurement to know if I'm growing, pleasing my God. I have a good reputation. You remember what Jesus himself told the church at Sardis? Revelation 3 and verse 1, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Notice, you have a name for yourself. You have a reputation that you're alive. But Jesus says that's all it is. It's a name. It's a reputation. He says you are dead. So here's someone that could say, Lord, we've got a great reputation as a congregation. Jesus says, you're dead as a cemetery. You remember in Luke 6 and verse 26? Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so their fathers did the false prophets. You know, that's what reputation is. It's nothing more than what others say about me. And so Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. You might have the best reputation in the world, but that doesn't prove anything because they spoke well of the false prophets too. So, so this, again, is not a legitimate measurement. I have a good reputation. We should have one, but that in and of itself is not going to tell me if I'm building, growing like I should. Here's another one. I know more Bible today than I used to. Once again, we should. We should be striving to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. But that in and of itself is not a legitimate measurement. It's a pseudo measurement. You remember in Matthew 4, verses 6 and 7, Satan quoted scripture. Satan himself knows Bible. And so once again, this won't cut it. I know more Bible. Are you obeying the scripture you know? Are you not just hearing the word but also doing it? You remember in John the fifth chapter, verses 34 and, uh, 39 and 40, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life and they bear witness of me and you're unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Interesting context. They search the scriptures. They were known for searching the scriptures, but Jesus says, in your search of the scriptures, you've missed me. You've missed me. And so this alone is not going to tell the tale of the tape. If we're growing, building as we ought. How about this one? I've grown more than, and at the bottom there's a blank. Sometimes we say, well, I've grown more than brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Well, remember 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Now, let's not compare ourselves with ourselves. Uh, you know, again, that, that's not going to prove anything. Sometimes we pick and point to the one that, that hasn't grown at all. And so we've grown a little bit. We've grown more than, again, a false measurement. That's not going to help us in determining if we're really growing and building this relationship with our God. What about this? I've been building for a long time. I've been a Christian for a long time. Thus, we equate time with growth. Now, that should happen. Most of these, you know, measurements here are legitimate if we understand them in the proper sense. But just to say, I've been building for a long time. I've been a Christian for a long time. You remember what the Hebrew writer tells the Hebrew Christians in chapter 5? Beginning in verse 11, he says, Concerning him, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. 
And he says, for the time has come that you ought to be teachers, but you have need for someone to come back and teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. So he says, you've had time too. You've had time to be teachers, but you haven't used that time wisely. Again, yes, we should use this time. And if we've been a child of God for years and years, yes, we should be able to say, I can see growth and, and I am building like I ought to. But that alone is not going to tell the story. Somebody says, well, I never miss a service. Now, once again, we shouldn't. We shouldn't miss a service. But this alone is not really going to tell us about our spiritual growth or our spiritual building, if it's acceptable with God. You remember in Jeremiah, the seventh chapter? God sends Jeremiah to the temple door, if you will, to the court of the temple house. And he's to preach to those people. And remember, part of what he says, don't, you know, hold on to, don't believe in deceptive words. And of course, what they've been saying is, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Jeremiah 7 and verse 4. They came to the temple. They came to the appointed place. And then in verse 10, they said, we are delivered. And God says, what are you saying? You think simply by coming by rote and going through this mechanically and then going out and living like the world that you have been delivered. Read Jeremiah 7 closely because what God is going to say is you've been delivered all right. I'm going to deliver you over to calamity, to catastrophe, to captivity. And so just saying I've never, I never miss a service, well, that's good. But let's make it better. Let's come with the right reason, the right motivation. And let's take what we hear and implement it into our lives. You remember 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 17? Paul told the Corinthians, they come together not for the better, but for the worse. They could say, Paul, we come together. He says, I know you do. But your heart's not right. The attitude's not right. Your living's not right. You come together, but not for the better, but for the worse. Another pseudo measurement. I'm more involved than ever before. Well, again, that's great. But how much were you involved before? You know, for some to be able to say that, it wouldn't take much. Because they're not involved. And so, as we strive with all of our fiber to grow and to build this relationship, Let's look for the proper measurements, legitimate measurements, whereby we can see and we can tell if we're growing like we should. Remember, this is harder to detect than the physical realm, the spiritual realm, the spiritual growth. It's harder to determine. Well, this last question, what are some legitimate measurements? That'll help us know if we're building as God desires. Look at these with me carefully and closely and quickly. Less self-oriented. I can be assured that I'm growing in Christ like He wants me to when I become less self-oriented. You can do the same. When you become less self-oriented, you remember Philippians 1 and verse 21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ. A lot of people can't say that today. Because they'd have to say, if they're honest, if they're truthful, for to me to live is self. It's all about self. In the very next chapter, Philippians 2, Paul talking about Timothy, verse 21, he says, For they all seek their own interests not the things of Christ. He's commending Timothy. He says, but you know Timothy. He's saying Timothy's not like that. But they all seek their own. We live in a society like that. You can rest assured as you sojourn in the flesh, as you try to build that relationship with God, that one of the sure signs is when you become less self-oriented. 
2 Timothy 3 and verse 2, men will be lovers of self. Let's avoid that. You remember in Luke 15, when the prodigal left, what did he say? Father, give me. He's all about self. Father, give me the share of the inheritance that falls me. When he came back, let me tell you something, he's grown. He's less self-oriented. He's not coming back saying, Father, I ran out of money. Father, I squandered my estate. Father, I'm only here long enough for you to give me some more money. No, he's not saying, Father, give me. He says, Father, make me. Make me as one of your hired men. That's spiritual growth. No longer thinking about self is no longer, Father, give me. Proverbs 30 and verse 15, the leech has two daughters, give and give. If we want to live this life like a leech, then that's what we say, Father, give me. Give me this, give me that. It's all about self. Here's a legitimate measurement to tell if we're growing. Another one, we outgrow some things. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 11 and following. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, understand as a child, reason as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What's Paul saying? We outgrow some things. We're no longer living like a child and childishly. We outgrow some things. Ephesians 4 and verse 22, we're to put off some things. And so we've outgrown that. We're, we're deeper than that now. We're striving to set our affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2. So we outgrow some things. We begin doing things on our own. You remember we mentioned Ephesians 4 and verse 22, we put off some things. Well, two verses later, Paul says, we put on some things now. He's talking about putting off some things that are, that are sinful, the old man, and we put on that new man created in righteousness. But we're doing things for ourselves. I'll guarantee you, you know I love the book of Nehemiah. And I, I would venture to say nobody grew any more than Nehemiah grew when he determined, you know, that I'm going to go to Jerusalem that I may rebuild it. Begin doing things for yourself. Remember, he's cupbearer to the king. At that time, he wasn't thinking about Jerusalem. He wasn't thinking about the Jews. But when his brother comes and tells him that the Jews are in distress, Jerusalem is burned with fire, the gates... You know, the wall, it's, it's been destroyed. He weeps, he mourns, he cries, he fasts. And then he says, I'm going to do something about it. You remember Isaiah? In Isaiah 6 and verse 8, Here am I, Lord, send me. That's a sign of spiritual growth. We have outgrown some things. We begin doing things. I'm talking about spiritual things on our own. We don't have to be plotted. We don't have to be <laughs> applauded. You know, we, we just have to realize I have a responsibility before my God. Notice this next one. Appetite increases. You, you can tell if you're growing spiritually, if your spiritual appetite is increased. You know, this, this will take care of the attitude that says, I don't need Sunday morning Bible class. I don't need Sunday evening. I don't need Wednesday night. When your appetite is growing, when you love God's Word and you want to feast on it, you don't want to miss those times. You remember Matthew 4 and verse 4? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's a spiritual appetite. Not living by bread alone, too many people in this life live like that. They live physical lives. Not by bread alone, but by every word. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5 and verse 6. You remember in Jeremiah 15 and verse 16, 
Thy words were found, and I ate them. And thy word became to me a joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah loved God's word, but you know what was stated earlier about his people? In Jeremiah 6 and verse 10, the word of God was a reproach to them. They had no delight in it. What polar opposites. Jeremiah said, I love God's word. They said, we can't stand it. You remember Job 23 and verse 12? I have treasured the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. Let me ask all of us this. We're, we're thinking about Thanksgiving. We've all envisioned that meal, <laughs> that Thanksgiving meal. We're going to do some damage, aren't we? Well, when's the last time we said, you know, I'm, I'm in a... Bible study for myself, and I can't wait to study God's Word. Or I've got a Bible study going with this couple, and I can't wait to get back with them. Or you know what? It's Saturday night, and I can't wait for Sunday morning when I'm there with God's people, and we're going to open up God's Word. Do we? Job said, I've treasured the words of your mouth, speaking to God, more than my necessary food. Let's strive to grow like that. That's an obvious and evident measurement of spiritual growth. We forgo our rights. We live in a right-oriented society. Everybody wants what's coming to them. They're going to stand up for their rights. And I mentioned this, I think, at the beginning of our you know, quarter for building a relationship with God. Next time you study the book of 1 Corinthians... Do something a little bit different. Go through it and look at this point right here. The Corinthians were spiritual babies. In chapter 3, Paul says, I wanted to write to you as spiritual, but I couldn't. I had to write to you as mere men, as, as babes in Christ. They were acting like spoiled babies. And this is really the problem going through the book of Corinthians. If they thought they had the right to do something, they were going to do it. And nobody could stop them. You remember in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 7, they're going to court against each other. And Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not be defrauded? Rather than taking the church's business before heathen courts, he said, forgo your rights. Even if it involves you losing something. Again, grow up, he's saying. Quit acting like mere men. Quit living as spiritual babies. Quit looking at everything and saying, mine, mine, and I'm not going to let go of it. In 1 Corinthians 7, you know what the problem is there? Husbands and wives withholding themselves from each other intimately, acting like little children. And so, once again, what does Paul say? Quit defrauding one another. Husbands, your body's not your own. It's your wives. And wives, your body's not your own. It's your husband's. Quit defrauding one another. You know, in chapter 8, what about this meat sacrificed to idols? Paul would say at first, eat it. There's no such thing as an idol. But then about midway in that chapter, he'll get deeper on the Corinthians. And he'll say, you know, I told you, yes, you could, but now I'm telling you, don't. Don't, if somehow, in any way, it's going to cause your brother to stumble. So Paul answers that question with both a yes and a no. And he leaves him to ponder that. And his point is, at the end of chapter 8, if meat is going to cause my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. What's Paul saying? I'll forego that right. If it's going to help my brother in Christ. In chapter 9... Paul says, you know, are we the only ones that, you know, could take along a believing wife? He says, I've, I've foregone that right. And, and all of this is leading up to chapter 11 and verse 1. Be imitators of me as I also am of Christ Jesus. That's what he's trying to get the Corinthians to see. You imitate me as I forego my right. You imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Could Jesus not have called 12 legions of angels? He could have. 
He had that right. He didn't have to die on the cross for us. He could have come down any time. But Jesus knew how to forego rights because of our wrongs. Here's a sure sign of spiritual growth. When you say as a child of God, you know, I know I have this liberty. I know I have this freedom, but I won't use it. I will not use it if it's going to hurt my brother. If it's going to cause my brother or sister to stumble somehow. And Paul uses that word somehow in 1 Corinthians 8. The world attracts us less. You know you're growing when that's true. Do not love the world, neither the things of the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vain glory of life, these are not from the Father, but of the world. And this world and its lust are passing away. But the one who does the will of God will abide forever. The world attracts us less. We're like that prodigal who's left that far distant country and we know that has nothing for me. I've been there, I've tried that, and I don't want that. There's nothing there. Again, we develop a deeper hatred for sin. You remember in Amos 5 and verse 15, hate evil, love good. You remember in Hebrews 1 and verse 9, speaking of Jesus, he loved righteousness. He hated lawlessness. Remember Romans 12 and verse 9, abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good. When we are building a relationship with God, when we're drawing ever closer to Him, we're leaving this wicked old world. We're getting farther and farther away from that because we're getting closer to our God. The world attracts us less. We have a deeper hatred for sin. And the last point, so obvious, a greater love for Christ. What did we say a moment ago? For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That was Paul's attitude, Philippians 1 and verse 21. In Philippians 3, he will show that even though he was excelling more than his countrymen in Judaism... He counted all that rubbish. He counted it all loss that he says, I might know Christ. A deeper, a greater love for our Lord. Paul would also say in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls me, having concluded this. One died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Building a relationship with God. Brethren and friends, it takes the best that we have. And not only takes the best, but guess what? God gives us back the best. He's already given us the best in Jesus Christ. And then as we build that relationship with him, as we grow as we ought, Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. James 1 and verse 17. And we have every spiritual blessing that's in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. You see, the Christian, the child of God who's faithful, they are the real winner in this life. They've lived the best life they can here. They have escaped eternal punishment. And they'll be blessed with eternal bliss, eternal life. Friend, if you're not a child of God, if you're not a Christian tonight, if you don't know what to do to become a child of God, you need to study with us, myself, one of the elders, one of the members here. If you have that appetite, it can be satisfied because we can look at God's Word and it'll tell you what to do. If you know what to do, then let's do it tonight. You've heard a portion of God's word. Let's unite it with faith. Let's repent of our sin. Let's confess Christ as Lord. Let's be immersed into Christ. Baptized that sins might be forgiven, washed away. Let's live a faithful Christian life. Building upon that one foundation. There's no other foundation that can be laid except that which has been laid. That's Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. And let's build upon that foundation 
with precious things. Silver, gold, precious stones. Paul would say, not wood, hay, and stubble. No, let's give it the very best we have. If you need tonight to respond to our Lord's invitation, we encourage you to. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. And if you need to come, we ask you to come right now as we stand together as we sing.